to take a look at Psalm 139 again, and uh, the message uh, this morning is called Person of the Week. I think you'll find it rather interesting. Psalm 139, this is a powerful text, I think one that you should know ex at least where it is in the Bible. Uh, it's a good text to... Uh, Identify when life begins. Some people seem to be confused about that in the times that we live today. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me, and you know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and my uh, in intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before you, and you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there, and in my bed in Shiloh, behold, you are there. And if I take wings of the dawn and dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. And I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. And even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day, and darkness and light are alike to you. For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. We'll stop there. You know, sometimes we do wonder, and we talked a little bit about this last week, uh, how significant is my life? And I think sometimes we fall into some depression, we get discouraged, and we just wonder, well, would the world really notice if I wasn't even here? Uh, do I make a difference uh, when I move, when I, when I act, when I do something? Does the universe notice that I'm even in existence? And we wonder that sometimes. And, and there are generations yet Un, of unborn who, whose lives will be shifted and shaped by the moves that you make and the actions you take. And I think sometimes we forget about that. It really does matter that you're here. And it matters to those generations after you that you are here. From tomorrow to the next day to the next Everything you do matters, whether it be good or bad, it matters because it makes a difference on somebody else's life. You have been created one of a kind. And on this planet Earth, there has never been one that was just like you. And there never will be again. Your spirit, your thoughts, your feelings, your ability to reason and, and act and all exist in no one else but you. Think about that. And the rarities that make you special are not mere accident. They're not a, a, a work of fate. You have been created in order that you might make a difference in this world. And you have within you the power to change that world. Every The beating of your heart has meaning and purpose. And the actions uh, have value far greater than silver or gold. And your life and what you do with it matters forever. And in so many ways, I am who I am and you are who you are because of those who have made an impression on your life. I am who I am because of my parents and because of the pastors that I had, the friends that I chose and uh, the instructors at the Bible college and 
And I am who I am because of a lot of you. Because you've made a difference in my life. Last week we, we talked a little bit about uh, the butterfly effect from Andy Andrews' book. And in this book he tells this story as he was ironing his shirt in his hotel room. Uh, he's watching, he's ironing his shirt and ABC News just happened to come on. It was on a Friday, April the 2nd, 2004. And the news was honoring a man who at that time was 91 years of age. And uh, the news program was running its regular segment. It's called Person of the Week, right? Anybody, how many of you have seen Person of the Week or know that it exists? Well, most of you probably watch Fox News then or something else. I don't know what you're watching. But uh, Person of the Week is something they do every single week on Friday. And they name somebody that made some sort of difference in the world. And usually the, the person that they honor, the, uh, the accomplishments are listed in advance, and by the time they get ready to announce who this person of the week is, most folks have already figured out who this person already is. And, but in this instance, uh, when the announcement was made, it kind of left viewers really puzzled. And so when the... Uh, person doing the news said, our, and our person of the week is, and the anchorman finally said, Norman Borlaug, you can just imagine the frowns, the frowns that people have. How many recognize this guy, by the way? You can imagine the frowns of people around the world when they heard this, who on earth is Norman Borlaug? Who is he? What did he do? Well, Norman made an impact. Norman Borlaug is a man who is personally responsible for drastically and dramatically changing the world as we live in it. Did you know that? He made a difference. They say he saved two billion lives. You see, in the early 1940s, Norman Borlaug hydrolyzed high-yield, disease-resistant corn and wheat for arid climates. From the Dust Bowl of, of Western Africa to our own desert in the Southwest, from the South and, and Central America to the plains of Siberia, across Europe and Asia, Borlaug's specific seed product flourished and regenerated where no seed had ever thrived before. And through the years, it has been calculated that Norman Borlaug's work saved from famine more than 2 billion people. Actually, it was never reported. And the anchor man was misinformed. It was not Norman Borlaug who had saved 2 billion people. And though few people caught the mistake, the real man that saved two billion people was not this man. It was a man named Henry Waller. Well, bring up Henry. Anybody know who Henry Wallace is? Huh? Well, Henry Wallace was the vice president of the United States under Franklin Roosevelt. And, uh, now wait a minute, you might explain. Now I thought Harry Truman was the vice president of, of uh, Roosevelt during that time. Well, Roosevelt served how many terms? Four terms. And uh, he had three different vice presidents. And the second man to serve as Roosevelt's vice president from 1941 to 1945 was Henry Wallace. Wallace was the former Secretary of Agriculture who, after his one term as vice president, was dumped from the ticket in favor of Truman. Keep following me here because this is all going to lead you somewhere. While Wallace was vice president of the... Uh, while he was vice president, 
He used the power of that office to create a station in Mexico whose sole purpose was to hybridize corn and wheat for arid climate. And he hired a young man named Norman Borlaug to run that office. So Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Prize and awarded the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, now considering the connection here, it was really Henry Wallace that saved two billion people because he was the one that put Norman Borlaug in charge of that office when he was a young man. Right? It really wasn't Norman Borlaug who ought to be person of the week. It really ought to be Henry Wallace. Right? Or could it be George Washington Carver? Do you know who George Washington Carver is? He's the peanut guy, right? George Washington Carver and the peanut, most people have that connection. But here's something that few people know about. While Carver was 19 years old and he was attending the Iowa uh, State University, he had a dairy science professor who on Saturday and Sunday afternoons would allow his six-year-old boy to go with him on a, a botanical uh, expeditions uh, with his brilliant student, George Washington Carver. It was George Washington Carver who took that little boy and instilled in him a love for plants and a vision for what they could do for all of humanity. And it was George Washington Carver who pointed this six-year-old boy and his name was Henry Wallace, who later became Vice President of the United States, who when he used that power, he placed Norman Borlaug in that station in Mexico, who was Person of the Week and saved two billion people. So really... It wasn't Norman Borlaug who should be Person of the Week, nor was it Henry Wallace who should be Person of the Week. It should be George Washington Carver. Amen? It's amazing to think about and to contemplate. George Washington Carver made a difference in this young man, this six-year-old boy who uh, began to... Uh, have an interest in, in these kinds of things who had an influence on all these people. By the way, George Washington Carver, uh, did you know that George Washington Carver was brought up in a Christian home and that he would lay and pray to God that God would instill with him an idea to help other people? A lot of people don't know that story either that he prayed to God that God would, through the Holy Spirit, would instill in him ideas. And George Washington Carver came up with 266 ideas that we're still using today that come from the peanut. Did you know that? He also used the sweet potato. There were 88 things that Carver originated from the sweet potato that we still use today. And while no one was looking, George Washington Carver, he kind of flapped his butterfly wings a couple times to this six-year-old boy who later became vice president of the United States. He placed Norman Borlaug in Mexico to come up with ideas to save the world from famine and save two billion people. And so maybe we should have George Washington Carver as the person of the week, right? Or 
was it the farmer from Diamond, Missouri? His name was Moses, and he's not the Moses we have here at church. He lived in a slave state, but he didn't believe in slavery. And his wife, Susan's best friend, was a, a black woman. But they lived in this in the state of Missouri, which was a slave state, but he didn't believe in slavery, and this made him a target for psychopaths like Quantrell's raiders who terrorized the area by destroying property and burning farms and killing people. And sure enough, on a cold January night, Quantrell's raiders rode through Moses' farm, and the outlaws burned and shot several people and dragged off the woman named Mary Washington, who refused to let go of her infant son, George. Now, Mary Washington's, uh, of course, she was a friend of the Moses family, best friend with, with Susan. And Susan was very distraught. She was, as soon as this happened, she went to work writing messages, trying to contact all the farms in the area to find out where they might be. And she finally got word to some neighbors. The towns, two days later, managed to secure the meeting place for Moses and the bandits, her husband. And Susan looked real anxious as her husband rode off on a black horse. And his destination was several hours away as a crossroads in Kansas to the north. And there at an appointed time, uh, on a cold January night, Moses met up with four of Quantrill's raiders, and they were on horseback carrying torches, and they had flour sacks over their heads, and they cut out holes for their eyes to see, and there the farmer traded the only thing that he had left on their farm, the only horse that they had, and the outlaws throw to him a dirty burlap sack. And the bandits thundered off on their horses, and Moses falls to the ground. And there alone, on that dark, wintry night, the farmer pulled from the bag a cold, naked, almost dead baby boy. And quickly he jerked open his coat and, he, and his shirt, and he placed the child next to his skin. And covering him with his own clothes and relying on the warmth of body heat, the man turned and he walked. He had given up his horse for this trade. And he walked through the night back home. And Moses walked through the night that night when he brought this child to his wife, Susan. And there they committed their lives to this tiny human being. And they promised each other that they would care for him, and raise him up in a Christian home. And they promised they would give this black child an education and honor his mother, Mary, who they knew was already dead. That night they gave the baby, their own name. And that's how Moses and Susan Carver came to raise a little boy named George Washington Carver. And so when you really think about it, maybe it was the farmer in Diamond, Missouri, who saved two billion people. Or was it the wife who was responsible, who was best friends with the baby's mother? Certainly she organized the effort. It was she who demanded immediate action. Unless, and we could go on forever and ever 
and ever and ever. Because it's a never-ending story, isn't it? Because one person's life affects another person's life, and you right now may have, you are affecting maybe generations from now. Hundreds of people. By the things you do and the choices that you make in the time that we have in this life. See, there's, we could go back so far because God created all of us for a reason and a purpose. And there are generations that are unborn who are going to be affected by your presence right here because you chose to be in church today. And you chose to live a Christian life. Every single thing we do matters, whether it be good or whether it be bad. We could use the opposite effect. There's people who made bad choices, who sons or daughters may be addicted to drugs or may be in prison, or, and that changes everything from that aspect. In Psalm 139, we are told that God created us. He created us in His image and He formed us. Our inward parts, He wove us together in our mother's womb. And, and David says, I give you praise for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and you know, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret, and secret place. And skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book, were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. God knew us before we were even born. And He has a plan for your life. He said before on planet Earth, there's never been one like you. There never will be a ever, ever again. You are it. Your spirit, your thoughts, your feelings, your ability to reason and act all exist in you and no one else. And the rarities that you have make you special because it's not by accident or, or by fat chance. It's You've been created in an order that you might make a difference in this world. And Jesus said that we are the salt and the light to the world. Amen? And within you, you have the power to change the world. And know that your actions can't be hoarded. They can't be uh, saved for later on. You, 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 you've, you've got to use those things that God has given you. The beating of your heart has meaning and gives purpose. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8 and verses 15 through 19. Your life and what you do with it matters forever. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 15 through 19 it says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself. Testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and if children heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so we may also be glorified with Him. We are put here for a purpose, and one of the purposes for the training and the preparation for the kingdom of God. Here in this text, we're told that, that we have been adopted by God. That we don't have a spirit of slavery, but we have a spirit of adoption, and we cry out, Abba, Father. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. As we said last week, you might be right now having a really tough time. 
be emotionally, financially, relationally, whatever it be. The fact is, all of us, as I said last week, are either going through a crisis or coming out of a crisis or getting ready to go into one. Because that's what life is about. In Psalm 134, we begin to think about David and his life and how he could have given up. And he could have, and there were times in his life where he was in despair and he was discouraged and he was depressed. But in those times, he found strength in the Lord. He, he went to the Lord. He, he says in, in Psalm 34, and verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. And he delivered me from my fears. And they looked to him, and they were radiant, and their faces were never to be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. And he saved him out of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. For to those who fear Him, there is no one. You know, I have this verse underlined, and you know where it is, right a place in the back of your Bible so that you can go to this text when you're in that period in your life, when you're going through a trial. And remember that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues him. And I really like Psalm 40. The reason why David was a man after God's own heart because God could see in David, and David opened his heart to, to God in his prayers and told him how he felt. And it's okay to tell God how you feel sometimes. Say, God, I'm really discouraged. God, I'm really depressed. God, why don't you answer me? These are the cries that David had as he wrote the Psalms, and he poured out his heart on these pages that we have today. And we need to have a relationship with God like David had a relationship with his God in the cave of Adullam. And in Psalm 40 it says, I wait, waited patiently for the Lord, he in, and he inclined to, to me and heard my cry. He brought me out of the pit of destruction and now the miry clay, and he set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm. And he put a new song in my heart. My mouth, a song of praise to our God. And many see and fear and trust in the Lord. Have you found yourself in the miry clay times in your life? No different than David or anybody else. He brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm, and put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to God. Now notice the focus here. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined his, to me. He heard my cry. This is what God did for him. He placed him on a solid rock. He took him out of the miry clay. And as a result, what did David do? He put a song in his mouth and a song of praise to our God. That's pretty powerful stuff. As we look at and conclude with Psalm 37, 1 through 11, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, 
for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, I don't think God wants us. He doesn't want to do harm to us. He wants. He would really like to bless each and every one of us. He wants to give us the desires of our heart. I believe we've got a God that loves us that much. He's made promises in His Word that He would do just that. On the other hand, we can't expect to be blessed if we're living in sin or if we're doing things that we shouldn't do. Here in this text, we learn this. We learn trust in the Lord and do good. Do those things which are pleasing to God. Dwell in the land. Cultivate faithfulness. Cultivate what? Faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. You do that a lot of times here at church. You might do it in your prayer life. You might do it to your friend. You might do that in fellowshipping. But you're delighting yourself in the Lord and your interaction with one another. A lot of times you do that at church. And He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way. That's, that's one of those verses you need to circle, underline, and put it in the back of your Bible if you can't find it later on. You will be. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He will do it. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. You know, a lot of times we don't want to wait for the Lord. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because the man who carries out wicked schemes cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil doing, for evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. And over one, two, three, four, five, at least five times in that long psalm it says that the righteous will inherit the land the meek will inherit the earth talking about the kingdom of God this morning as we sing our last hymn if you need special prayer this morning we invite you to come forward you can make a difference in somebody's life and you're making a difference right now in your children your grandchildren Children that will follow you, they're going to what you do every single day. How you act makes a difference, and it does matter. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher.